Over half the male population in the world is Asian. And I'm one of them. A few years ago, my first feature film, Foreign Ghost, premiered in this theatre. I played a small role in it, a character called Albert Wu. After the screening, people kept coming up to me and asking, Who is Albert? Who is this Albert character? And why did you portray this Asian man the way you did? Being both Albert and the filmmaker, I was expected to have a handle on his character. Now my therapist would say, Albert is a figment of your imagination, a creation of your subconscious. In reality, I don't know who Albert is. In my film, Foreign Ghost, he was an Asian man in search of a wife. Nevertheless, these questions about Albert started me thinking about Asian men in general and the stereotype used to represent us. Hey! So I started asking myself, is this the way people see Asian men? Is this the way Asian men want to be seen? Who enjoys to be typecast as a cliche? The answer is obvious. Shh. After the communist revolution in China, many families, like my grandfather's, were dispersed all over Asia. My father wound up in Malaysia, where I grew up. I grew up with these men, men who inherited from their fathers, values passed on by their grandfathers, including a code that teaches them to be silent and not question the old ways. I ask myself, what happens to Asian men in the West? Who are we? Are we simply Albert Wolves? And where do I find the Asian men I can identify with? To be misconceived, misunderstood, misrepresented, it's upsetting. So, to better understand Albert and myself, I decided to ask some friends. Friends like my buddy Garish Bansal, Whatever an Asian want, man who grew up in right. Canada. It's, remember, you're my mentor. The most prejudice, I guess you could say, I faced was during the Gulf War. At the time, I had a mustache. And I think a lot of people thought I was Iraqi. It was amazing. I, at first, I thought it was in my mind, but it was very, very evident that people were like, oh, you're the cause of what's going on. Excuse me, I'm not even Iraqi. And even if I was, I don't think I'm the cause of it, you know? You think I'm, uh, all, I may also be uh, intimidating and threatening yeah. due to the way I look, yeah. which is another yeah. stereotypical image of the, all the terrorists. terrorists. Salman Hussein was born in Pakistan, spent his teenage years in Hong Kong, before his family moved to Montreal, Canada. Salman, how do you define yourself? I'm a practicing Muslim. I'm brown. I'm South Asian. Because of, I'm of Indian descent, I connect with the whole South Asian diaspora. And also, I'm queer. So I primarily define myself brown, queer, Muslim boy. <laughs> Either that they must be Performance the artist Tetsuru Sekamatsu is a second-generation Canadian, ultra-yellow, cool. 
People tend to assume I'm a master of the martial arts. Now, as you can well see, this assumption's not entirely untrue. I remember being in uh, Concordia Film Studies program. And, uh, I'm not sure why they showed this film, but it was narrated by Lauren Green, and I think it's called The Yellow Peril. And it was one of those warning films about, uh, I don't know, to sell war bonds. Lauren Green's sonorous voice, you know, he's talking about, you know, the yellow nip, you know. Short and stocky as he may seem, you know, he's actually a very tenacious fighter. And it was funny because the, the narration was on one hand completely derogatory and racist concerning, in this case, Japanese soldiers. And yet the subtext, you could sense that there was a, a begrudging admiration for what a tenacious warrior they were. These representations of Asian men are a turn off for me. You know, the Fu Manchu type, egg roll man, it's the chop, chop, chop sword. And of course, Bertie Num Num. Look at my eyes. Amorito! You don't want to challenge everybody because what do you get? You get confrontation. And that defeats the whole purpose. That kind of. Uh, that kind of philosophy I think the Chinese has is actually what have made them survive. Eh? Asian people are taught to be, to, to, uh, are, are taught very young not to stir, not to um, make trouble, not to uh, rock the boat, and to suffer in silence. You know, um, I think that's the problem. To suffer in silence. Perhaps this has to change. Perhaps Asian men have to break the ancient code of silence. She shoots a line to take away the pain. She'll never be the same. I was born in Malaysia. I was educated there. I went to university there. And I lived in England. And then from England, I went to Canada. And now here, I live in New York. My friend Ming Li is a jazz singer. He's a performer in the musical Miss Saigon. I just had an incident uh, last week. I was with my bicycle uh, coming down the elevator and uh, it stopped and a couple walked in. They were like, kind of like yuppie, you know, older yuppie couple. I felt intuitively that they disregarded me because I was Asian and I had a bicycle and they thought that I was like a bus boy. She stood right in front of me. She stood right in front of me with her, with her hair sticking against my face. I wanted to get out before her. First of all, I was a bit late for my work. She said, you chink, you know, couldn't you, uh, 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 can't you see that I, I, I have to leave first and all that sort of thing. I said, don't call me chink, you ugly bitch. I call her an ugly bitch. <laughs> but that's not everybody, you know. In Vancouver, I met a champion who was born in Canada. In 1932, 13-year-old Harvey Lowe became the yo-yo champion of the world, the richest kid on the block. was a very good yo-yo player, I must admit, <laughs> that uh, I've never had anybody say, 
this is a Chinese guy or something like that, or a Chinaman, they used to say, huh? I, but if I ever hear it, I would stop him right away and says, please be more polite. And I'm, I'm like that all my life. I like to straighten them out. Who are the role models that help us change our perceptions of Asian men? Who? Is Jackie Chan a role model? On my voyage of discovery, I ask, I seek, and I find myself in Hong Kong, visiting Jackie, an Asian man recognized around the world. Then the rhythm. Nobody understands. A lot of people fighting start, they, they just know fighting. No, it's, it's not fighting. Fighting is an art. Jackie Chan yeah. represents Asian man. Yes. Well, I know him. He's a good actor. He's a good actor. Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan's cool. Jackie, Jackie Chan's cool. I, I really don't have a many idol. <laughs> Until Bruce Lee comes out. Yeah. Then I suddenly I find somebody. Wow. He's my idol. Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee are problematic stereotypes for me and my friends. I could think of like Mahatma Gandhi, I think, of his connection with with the common people. One of my heroes was probably my grandmother. She spoiled me, but you know, she would always teach me stuff. I'd look in the mirror and I'd see uh, Arthur Fonzarelli, you know? So, who do I look to for guidance? How big is the Chinatown here in Vancouver? What do you mean? Population wise? Yeah, yeah population wise. 250, 300,000. Graduated from Vancouver College in 1943. British colonel came in and interviewed me and said they need Chinese to, Chinese speaking Chinese, to jump behind the lines in Malaya. See, this is something very new to me. I, I didn't even know the Chinese Canadian were actually fighting the Second World War. <laughs> You're not the only one. I don't think. Ottawa would realize that until a couple of years ago that we had over 150 Chinese Canadians, mostly from Vancouver, that, that was attached to the British Army, which operates in India, Burma, Malaya. Eh? Nobody knows about it. Eh? It's now coming out that we, you know, we couldn't even tell people until 25 years after the war. We had to sign the Secrecies Act, not to say anything. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, you, you're, you're liable to be sent to jail. Eh? Herb Lim was willing to die for Canada, a country where he was not granted full citizenship. In order to be equal to the round eyes, I had to be twice as good to do the same job. After the war, Herb Lim was given a medal, the Boomer Star, for his valor in action. I belong to the Burma Star Association. Eh? I was there six years. No one talked to me. But my aim was to impose my presence on them. I wanted to penetrate. I wanted to uh, infiltrate, uh, sabotage. I want to impose myself on them. Get even, not get mad. Eh? Work harder, strive more. Eh? Uh, that's always been my philosophy. And I teach that to my children as well. The Second World War contribution of Chinese immigrants like Herb Lin earned Asians the right to vote in Canada. Back in 1943, there were 20,000 Chinese in Vancouver, mostly men, mostly bachelors, no Caucasian girls allowed, and no hanky-panky, I was told. Do you know of anyone actually uh, crossover, actually dating or seeing a white woman? Yeah, there were some. And how were they treated um, in those days? 
I think they were ostracized by both sides. Both sides ostracized them. And as a result, you know, their, their, their offspring suffered as, as, as well. I think they suffered more, the offspring. I had a brother who married a, uh, a Canadian girl. She's a full-blooded Canadian girl. And uh, the Chinese didn't accept her. Her family didn't accept my brother. And so they were together by themselves quite a bit, too. Your first wife is half German, half Chinese, and this very romantic image. Well, especially we flying the plane every weekend down there. And uh, you were married for 10 years. Now you're married to a Chinese woman for 30 years. 30 years. To, now, was it a conscious decision to, like a second marriage, that maybe you want to marry a, a Chinese woman? It wasn't a conscious decision. It was, it was done, that's all. Yeah. It wasn't thought about. It was just natural. So it was love? Yeah, it was, she, it was love. her. You know, her, I don't care whether she was black or blue. I would, have, I would have married her anyways. Now, you were telling me that y you were a lover. No, <laughs> no, I said I would like to be, to be a lover. But in effect, uh, you, you are. Know, I mean, how many men actually <laughs> flew down you know, uh, every weekend to meet this girl, the quarter girl? I mean, this is, oh, this everything, is was, e everything was there. Either you drive down, you fly down. Right. No big deal. Oh, it's faster. Eh? Well, it's yeah. more dramatic. And more and dangerous, too. Yeah. There was time there that I <laughs> really didn't know I was going to make it. Now you're a living fact that you know uh, Chinese men are romantic, uh, just as I'm a living ways. fact. Oh, now come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, how come you, know, you don't see it? My friends will laugh at me because of that, you know. Okay. Surrender with good reason and face the music and dance. Dance, dance, look inside, dance around, dance around, and never. In the early days, interracial marriage had its hurdles. But over the years, things began to change. Perhaps John and Yoko were one of the most influential couples to give a positive spin to the liaison between Asian woman and non-Asian man. All the Asian women I met, or knew for that matter, or they're all you know, dating white guys. And they had no interest in dating Asian men. If you are living in um, white majority society, I mean, you know, it's very, it's very natural for an Asian girl to go with um, a, white, a white guy, or a black guy for that matter. I had to face the reality of my own short romantic history. Since I've been here in Canada, I've dated only one Asian girl. And that didn't work out. Smile. Okay, one more. You go over there. Take the picture, Albert. Oh. Now. Oh, here. But now, fortunately, I have met Albert, take the an Asian woman, a friend I adore, Cecilia Cristobal. My father's half Filipino, half Spanish. My mother's Filipino. They came from the Philippines, both of them. Uh, met here, and I was born here. Well, I was born in Winnipeg. Um, and we grew up here in Montreal. I was told, you know, not to get involved with Filipino men by certain people, you know, because they're, they're charmers and they just, you know, they, they'll, they'll use you and then break your heart. So I didn't really, I wasn't leaning towards that. And I did have an experience with a Filipino guy, which wasn't the best. He was exactly like that. And I knew from a young age that I probably wouldn't marry somebody who was Filipino. And I told my parents that. I said, don't count on it because it's not going to happen. Why? Could it be because Cecilia grew up influenced by images like this? Perfectly Come here! And images like this. You know, in, in those movies, most of the Chinese women marry Lo Fan, eh? mm -hmm. round eyes, not the Chinese. And they do marry the Chinese the men. The men are, are stereotyped as mean, uh, uh, 
tight wads, uh, uh, dominating, eh? things like that, unreasonable. Eh? Joy Luck Club. Yeah, that's right. I almost walked out away from that show, to be honest. And I said, I can't stand it because they, really, they were really uh, uh, knocking the Chinese men down. And you know, and I know, we are not like that. Because the soul if we are not like that, then why do more Asian women marry non-Asian men than the other way around? I'm surprised about that. I can see that. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Because it's a way for them to sort of assimilate to the mainstream. It's easier to get things done. Mm -hmm. And also there's this, this sort of idea of beauty. Latching like, on do, because of power, white privilege, and also having some aesthetic involved. You're saying right. both. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's a lot of historical precedents, like, um, you know, Puccini with uh, Madame Butterfly certainly wasn't the first one, but there's a long historical pedigree of eroticizing uh, the Asian female, you know, as this uh, very submissive, highly uh, skilled paramour. And I think that's a white Western male fantasy. And it's such a predominant one of the Asian woman being so ultra-feminine that Asian men, in turn, by association, become somewhat emasculated. Asian women have a better time because they're being seen for the beauty, because they're petite and they're elegant and they're refined, and they're not as aggressive as, let's say, um, Caucasian women. Uh, <clears throat> and um, for for Asian men, they are not seen so much for their masculinity. It's as though like Asian men have no sexuality at all. I do have a lot of movies have a romance, but at the end, you know what? Cut, because romance is not like a. You have to sell up, sell up, sell up, sell up, then kiss. It's not don't don't kiss them fighting. No, and also the camera movement very slow, and audience come in. To the theater, see Jackie Chan movie. They just come on, do something action. Even they, when I kiss, I have to do the com comedy and humor. That's what they like it. Why are we more comfortable with Asian men as warriors and workers than as lovers? <laughs> Masculinity um, has a lot to do with um, a perceived to have to do with uh, size. You know, some little Oriental men, big like this, and some big European men, like this. You never can tell. Really? Sometimes women have a preference, like, oh, like, you know, tall, dark, and handsome, and like Italian men, and like black men. But very rarely will you meet a non-Asian woman who says, oh, I really like Asian men, you know? When I would meet a Japanese woman, the first thing that she would think to herself is, oh, here's a man. And that's pretty normal. I mean, that's the experience that most men would have here. Oh, here's a man. But I realize that here in Canada, when I meet a woman, they tend to think, oh, you're uh, pretty cute for an Asian. So there was always the perceptual hurdle to overcome. Perhaps stereotyping is universal, a superficial way to judge people. Perhaps stereotypes haunt all of us like foreign ghosts. Like Albert Wu haunts me. Human nature tends to stereotype everybody. You know, I have I have uh, images of, of of other races or other ethnic groups. Uh, we all commit that same uh, crime, so to speak. Eh? So you're saying to me, how can we change it? Eh? How can we change it? I think it, it it's it's up to people like you, you and my son to change it, because they have the opportunity now. Looking forward to the day when we can see some Asian male role model who doesn't have to throw punches or kicks or do his own stunts. And you know, those things are great. Those things are fantastic. But it almost seems like a prerequisite. Okay, perhaps I was wrong. Everywhere I look, I see more and more Asian men and non-Asian women. Albert, take the picture. All right, all right.
I also discovered that Asian women like Cecilia have their own issues surrounding Asian men. A lot of Asian men, they really love their mothers. They're real mama's boys. You say that you're a mommy's boy. Yeah, mommy's boy, that's right. Yeah, I like to be mommy's boy. Who doesn't, right? Uh, I mean, hey, she, uh, she stood her ground many times with me when she's not happy with certain things. Uh, but, you know, in the end, I'm her son, right? So I just, I just flash her a smile and, you know, say, I'm sorry, mommy, and, you know. When they're looking for a wife, they want somebody similar. You know, they're not necessarily going to gravitate away from that. Whereas the women um, probably try to break away from tradition. She's done everything that she possibly can to provide the best environment for both my sister and myself. You know, the stereotype with, with Asian men in the family is they're the breadwinners. They're the ones to go out and work and do all of this. And, and the women should just marry and have babies. Asian men, however, have their own problems at home. We do, we do still have a, like a Chinese traditional that like women, after get married, stay home. They're not as active as the male. The house is so small. They tell the wife, yeah, go out for a dinner party, then you go to karaoke, blah, 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 blah. Then coming back, tell the wife, I'm so tired. Yeah. Then the wife, I said, yes, you say. So, no, everybody liar. Mm. Playing mahjong, you know, go to disco, karaoke, then going back, the wife stay home. But when the wife come out with him, the whole table, quiet. The male, they don't like your wife, no my wife. I don't let my wife go your wife because you stay with... Always like that, that makes divorce and you know, all kind of things. It turned out that my father was actually married, which my mother didn't know. Had four kids. It still hurts my mother, I think. And in fact, his ex-wife died uh, last year or two years ago. Yeah, so now it's as though everything is okay. Although they still, they got married, they had a civil ceremony. They didn't get married in the church because you can't do that if you're divorced. So now I think my mom wants to get married in the church and then everything will be okay. My grandfather was a rich landowner. Before the communist revolution in China, Men like my grandfather owned land, property, and woman. Yes, woman. Grandfather owned 18 legal wives. Legend has it, he also had hundreds of concubines and thousands of sons and daughters. Is it any wonder that I'm still trying to come to terms with the fact that my grandfather had 18 wives and that my father has several mistresses? It is wrong, but it, it happened in Hong Kong. It happened in, Hong, in whole Asia. Uh, whole Asia? Yeah. It's just that you, within you, have questions and desires and what is natural, you can't suppress it. So it was in the States that uh, I went to an NYU party, I was talking to this guy, yada, yada, yada. One thing led to another, and end of the party, he kissed me. Just the world went topsy-turvy for me. I, I was thinking, gotta, you know, my thoughts were like, wow, this is like dynamite explosions, and I have to dump my girlfriend. <laughs> At that point, I said to myself, this is better than sex. Because I had never experienced such emotions, passion, tenderness, the whole feeling, the senses. It was like I was, I, I thought I was lost before. I was really lost then, you know, like confusion. I had to struggle a lot throughout my life, especially in my earlier years, uh, with my sexuality, you know. And um, I knew I wasn't going to get married because uh, I was, you know, more attracted to my own kind. 
you know, I, I was very active in the theater, in music, and, and, in, and it was kind of like a sublimation for me, I suppose, you know. But because um, at that time, I, you know, it's just too risky and, 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 and just nobody wants to talk about it anyway. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can't, you can't declare that you're gay or anything like that. So, um, so I, I, I sublimated a lot of my feelings um, into my art. I'm in the middle of an island. I'm in the middle of the sand. I'm in the middle of a desert. I'm in the middle of the palm of your hand. Queers are a, a butt of all jokes and, 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 and films and, and dramas. And, uh, um, they're looked upon as, as subhuman or not subhuman. There's the sexism going on because why do you want to be like a woman? And woman being, of course, uh, it's not said out loud, but it's inferior. You know, there, that's sexism. You know, why would a man want to be like a woman when a woman is inferior? I could listen, but I could not talk. The man has really put me on the spot. As I turn to run, I realize his cry for love could well be mine. Well, I only came out to them last year. My mother said, no, take it back. <laughs> like the truth of it didn't matter. My friends won't accept it. The, the Pakistani community won't accept it. For without love, it's a crying shame because every man has a love to gain. I'm in the middle of an island. I'm in the middle of the sand. I'm in the middle of the desert. I'm in the middle of the palm of your hand. And that suggests that the society is so heterosexist that because of my coming out, my parents are going into a closet. Cecilia is finally getting married. But not to me. She's marrying a white man. Not just any white man, but my best friend, my colleague, my director of photography. So, it amazes me whenever any Asian man insists on marrying into his own culture. That's it. Hey. <laughs> Alright. You guys are so cute outside. Honey bucks, not got, bad, eh? You've got film. I've got film. You've got color. You've got color. Let's go. Carl Liu grew up in Canada. He speaks no Chinese. Not did he pay much attention to Chinese girls until he had a change of heart. What's you know, what's attractive to your, to your eye. And uh, I found that uh, in university, uh, you know, the Chinese girls were beautiful. Get out on the grass. We don't want the hands to get out. Here. I found a, a, a natural attraction to them. One, two, three, four. Oh, <laughs> and I knew that I was going to most likely end up marrying a Chinese woman. Why? I can't tell you why. It's just, it's just, why do you fall in love? <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you want to move this way and I'll go here? Yeah, wherever you want, wherever you want. That would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Carl is like many Asian kids who grew up in Canada. He denied his roots. He only started reclaiming them as an adult. <laughs> Yeah, you did your way. He decided to marry an Asian girl to go the distance to perform the traditional marriage ceremony. That means spending the whole wedding day on the knees. No, you can put them up and have to go to No, I said, come 
Then, there's my buddy Garish. He also decided to follow his family's tradition of arranging marriages. How could you possibly decide to spend the rest of your life with a woman you only met once? Basically, there's two ways of looking at it. Whereas you had a love marriage, where you were in love with each other and you got married, whereas ourselves were put into that situation which we both have accepted, we're put together, not really knowing each other, but in the process of trying to make this marriage work, we fall in love. Imagine if I was to marry someone that was non-Indian, because marriage in itself is such, such a difficult task. Why start off in the red? I found someone that also believed in the same thing. I'm talking about coming on Sunday to my uh, church, knowing what time the service is, knowing exactly what is expected from us here, going to you know relatives' houses, following the customs and traditions. At least with Hindu, she's already aware of, the, all, of all of these customs and traditions. I don't have to worry about that. Everything else uh, we may disagree on, financial, but that you would disagree regardless of the culture. I don't think it's a crime to marry someone within your own culture. I think all I was trying to do was facilitate my life and facilitate any future problems that I may have. It's, is it an easy way out? Is it a chicken way out? Maybe it is, but I mean, you don't need the hassle. I used to laugh at the idea of matchmaking. It so reminds me of my grandfather's world. But now, after having been in several failed relationships, I don't know anymore. In recent years, I've started noticing the personal ads. Is this approach to finding a mate any different than arranged marriage? Isn't it like a self-administered matchmaking plan? A so-called SMMP? Well, I think it is. And now I no longer laugh about it. Perhaps I'm going through a spiritual crisis. For me, falling in love is like going to heaven. But commitment is like dying. I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. While in India, I consulted a modern guru. Well, actually, a psychologist. Are you in economic class or business class? <laughs> Marriage is a public commitment of a personal relationship. So it's socially structured, it's a structured thing. And especially in arranged marriages, you don't have that emotional relationship. And probably you won't have it unless you share the same amount of emotional transactions which you otherwise share with your brother and sister or parents. And uh, that is why if you are looking at a marriage, besides having biological gratification of your natural needs, which come also to sustain that relationship so that it develops into an emotionally stable relationship and even spiritual that's related. Because the right marriage is really, you don't even require the physical presence of the spouse. You need to know that he is there or she is there. And that is far more important. This next story is called a language barrier. In Japan, there is no place for verbal aggression. Yeah. 
It makes sense. Like, my cousin Blake once told me about the time he saw a Scorsese film in Japan, and one of the heavies said, Ain't no motherfucking way. But the Japanese translation was, Soro ni mo. Which means, nevertheless. <laughs> but the times were tight. Nevertheless, no barrier is more difficult to overcome than language. And practice. What is it you do that is so important? I'm going skateboarding. You got a problem with that? Yes, problem. You skate the boat too much. That is problem. Go pull out weeds in vegetable garden. Ah, Dad, can we get a gardener for that? Gardener? When I was your age, we had no garden, no house. Everything got destroyed. Well, I mean, isn't that way like you left Japan? I mean, because to give me like a better life? Well, this is it, Dad. This is it. Sayonara. My dad grabbed my skateboard and threw it across the driveway. I hate you! <laughs> my father retaliated with a torrent of caustic consonants and spraying saliva. <laughs> I couldn't understand a word he was saying, but I could see by the changing colors in his face, he was coming up with some extremely nasty variations of nevertheless. Nevertheless. The language barrier between generations is always the most difficult to overcome. I was the one, the only one who my father really spoke to. And we didn't really speak, but sometimes we would uh, sit and read the newspapers together. My father, being a journalist, used to read a dozen different newspapers every day, and I'd sit beside him and I'd read it. We'd talk about different things. So during my childhood, I remember having this kind of unspoken intimacy with him. I haven't seen my father in over 10 years. Before that, he never spent much time with me. But I know that he loved me by the way he sheltered me, fed me, educated me. That's what he learned from his father. That's what he tried to teach me. But it's not the love I wanted. I wanted quality time. I wanted to play with him to know him as a man, as a friend, as my mentor. I ask myself often, if I become a father, would I be able to give my child the love I never had? I feel that even though I have such great friends and so on and so forth, I cannot lean on anyone except my father. Uh, my father is my soundboard. I mean, I've talked to him about, for example, queer issues, and intellectually, he understands. By virtue of the authority vested in me as president of the academy, I hereby bestow on you the honorary title, Fellow of the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. I was born in a very poor family. Only thing I remember is my father for the China Revolution. They skipped from China to Hong Kong. And that time nothing to do, my father suddenly be a cook. He, he was working in a French embassy in Hong Kong Mount. My mom, she's a maid to clean for Mrs. Ambassador. Then my father, my, pet, my mom, they moved to Australia, American Embassy. So my father took me to the Chinese opera school. After a few years, I do hate my parents. Why? Because every weekend, every holiday, we, we like a, about 100 children on the school. We sleep in the school, eat like a boarding school in Hong Kong. And every parents come to take the children go out for Sunday, except me. Nobody take me go out. And I was I was quite upset. But later on, later I said, why my father go away? Why put me there? <laughs> Finish contract. My father coming back. He bought me a house. Then I realized 
all my father leave me because he want to save money, work. Everything good for me. Then I forgive my parents. Then I, I love my fa father again, love my mother again. Yeah. Don't you want to be like your father, setting a good role model for your kid? No, but that's... Someone that he can look up to? But... Uh, but I am like being my father, even if I am with a guy. Because I'm, you know, I'm... That can be taken in as a good role model quality. To be with someone in, in honesty and an equal partnership with. It's, you know, and that's what my father has with my mother. I'm carrying those values. One day, never forget, I was still on the ambassador kitchen. The kitchen, big, big, twice bigger than here. My father stayed there. He didn't open any light. Very dark. I just sit there. I would sit like this, eating something. I, my father was standing behind, white dress, you know, white hair. Suddenly, my father turned around. Jackie, I said, yes. Look, I'm 60 years old, still can cook. What about you? Would you, you still can fight when you're 60? Then he turned around. Then I look at my father. I just feel very sad. Yes. Okay, I know my, my father. What he, maybe he want me to cook. Then at night, I go to my friend's uh, restaurant to learn how to cook. He's right. How long you can fight? I have to let go of my old perceptions because I'm discovering a new sense of what it means to be an Asian man in the West. Like Kerb Lin, who used to fly to his love every weekend, I have to go the distance. You're flying in an airplane at night by yourself. You are in control of your whole life. Eh? All you can see is the stars. And you make a false move, that may be the end. Every time I like, you know, when I did uh, my parachute jumps, eh? I'm afraid of height, you know, believe it. I won't even go up an elevator. But you have to volunteer in order to do your jumps in the army. They cannot force you out. So every time I jump, it's like, I'm gonna die. And that first, maybe 200 feet, eh? 300 feet, when you're free falling 120 miles an hour, which is terminal speed, eh? You know, you're waiting for your chute to open. You're dying until that chute pops up, and then you know you're reborn. When I set out on this journey, I wanted to discover who Albert Wu is and give voice to the silence. Now, I realize I'm actually giving voice to myself. To think of myself as a man, a man like any other, I had to die. And be born again. Finally, I hear the voices of my own role models right here around me. To tell you the truth, I didn't know who Albert was when I started out. Now I do. You're looking at him. I want to persevere like Herb Lim. I want to be assured like Irish Bansal. I want to be ultra yellow cool like Tetsuro Sikamatsu. And finally, like the courageous Salmon, I want that kiss that's better than sex. So dance around, dance, dance, until you drop, yeah, yeah. Dance, dance.
Mommy's boy. Yeah, I like to be mommy's boy. Who doesn't? He's my idol. Dance the rhythm. Ah! 